Well, today's class is going to bring us back to what is really a great discovery uh, in early archaeology, and that's the discovery of the biblical site of Nineveh. What you have to try and remember throughout this course is that we'll be going from one country to another, one continent to another, slipping back and forth. So the class today, the events I describe, were happening at the same time, more or less, as Thompson and Warsaw were trying to sort out the prehistoric past. The European public had only recently become aware of Egypt in many ways, thanks to Champollion's decipherment of the hieroglyphics. Uh, Egypt, of course, features a lot in the Bible. And many European people and scholars, well, began to wonder, well, you know, what parts of the Bible are really true? What other evidence can we find for people in the Bible times, the kings, the rulers, the different peoples? And it was realized that the evidence would most likely be found in that area known as Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia is the name we give, or the Greeks gave, to the region between the rivers Euphrates and Tigris. Mesopotamia, meso in the middle of, Potamia, two rivers. Hippotamus, hippo, horse, potamus, water horse. See, you'll learn an ancient Greek as you go along. You didn't realize you'd be doing that, but you are. Uh, so Mesopotamia, which according to the uh, Bible, was where the original Garden of Eden was. It's where the prophet Abraham comes from. It was also the location of many cities mentioned in the Bible, the enemies of the Israelites, in particular a place called Nineveh. Well, Nineveh featured in the Bible because it was the capital city of the Assyrians. And the Assyrians were known to have invaded what we now call Israel in about 701 BC and defeated the Israelite people there. Well, in the early 19th century, not very much was known about Mesopotamia. It was technically part of the Ottoman Empire. But in reality, it was controlled by local tribes. So very few travelers actually went to visit that area. It was thought to be terribly unsafe. Uh, it was known that this must be where the centers of places like Nineveh, but exactly where Nineveh was, nobody had any idea. Some travelers in the 17th century had actually gone into Mesopotamia in search of these same Bible cities. And the earliest man that we know of to do this was an Italian, Pietro della Valle, who went to Mesopotamia between 1618 and 1626, and he became the first European to study the ancient remains of Mesopotamia and to write a report on this. When he got back to Italy, he published a report on what he'd seen, and he mentioned that throughout Mesopotamia, you could see several of what the Arabs called tells. Well, a tell in Turkish would be huyuk. It's the remains of an ancient city. Ancient cities in the eastern part of Turkey, throughout the Middle East, were built of mud brick. And when mud brick decayed, it collapsed, and gradually houses would be built on top of each other, forming something like this, a city mound, in Turkey is a hoyuk, in Arabic a tell. But De La Valle saw many of these, and a few of them he also recognized strange structures like this. The remains of towers or buildings that stood much higher than the actual city. Well, he knew his Bible very well, and he recognized these for what they were. These were the remains of ziggurats. The ziggurat was the ancient form of temple in Mesopotamia in the biblical period. So he was able to explain that Mesopotamia had many tales, the remains of ancient cities. He couldn't identify any of them that some of them had ziggurats, so therefore they must be temple centers. He also brought back with him the first news of a strange form of writing used in Mesopotamia. What he saw were clay tablets, writing tablets, but also rock inscriptions in which the words were formed using triangular shapes like this. Well, a Latin word for a triangle or a wedge shape is cuneus, so this particular script became known as cuneiform. 
Over the next 200 or so years after De La Valle first reports cuneiform, many scholars tried to work out exactly what it was. It was gradually realized that cuneiform came in three different styles. So therefore, there were three different languages represented in cuneiform. But nobody made any breakthrough in understanding cuneiform until 1837, when Sir Henry Rawlinson, an English diplomat serving in Persia and India, spent a lot of time working on some of the, the cuneiform inscriptions in Persia, and he was able to decipher the first of these, actually work out what it was. It was an older form of 19th century modern Persian. So it took quite a lot of work, and I can give you a whole class on what that involved, but uh, I, I won't give you that one as well to go with the hieroglyphs. Once cuneiform could start to be read, this renewed an interest in Mesopotamia. If you could read some of the cuneiform scripts, then hopefully it would be possible to actually identify some of the city centres mentioned in the Bible, Nineveh and other places. And one of the people who became really interested in this possibility was an English lawyer called Austin Henry Layard. He was a failure in many ways. He was very bad at his exams. But then a family friend offered him a job in Ceylon, Sri Lanka, which was then part of the British Empire. And so he worked very hard on his studies, he passed his law exams, and he realised that this was an opportunity to travel overland through Mesopotamia, making his way via Constantinople down to Basra at the head of the Persian Gulf, from where he could take a ship that would eventually lead him to Ceylon. He started out on his journey in 1839 with a friend of his, a man called uh, Edward Mitford, who was also going to Ceylon. They made their way across uh, Europe to Constantinople. It was then that Layard discovered why Mitford wanted to, to go overland as well. Mitford was terribly seasick and he couldn't face the journey all the way from Britain around Africa to India. So Mitford was along really uh, just as a sort of assistant and friend. Having arrived at Constantinople, they made their way after a few days there to Aleppo in Syria. And by this time, they'd taken several months on their journey. It was already 1840. So they spent the best part of a year traveling there. And they decided that they had to get to Baghdad and then Basra as fast as possible. And as Layard wrote in his diary, we decided to travel lightly and careless of comfort, the title of this particular class. They made their way from Aleppo. They realized the easiest way to get to Baghdad would be to go to Mosul, going along the northern edge of the Mesopotamian plain, and then they could sail down the Tigris River, which would make their journey a lot easier. On their way through Mesopotamia, Layard saw several tells. He could see that these were the remains of ancient cities. But when he arrived at Mosul, he saw one of the most remarkable sites, the most remarkable site he had ever seen in his journeys. When he arrived at Mosul, then a reasonably sized town with a British and a French consul, he could see that on the other side of the River Tigris, there were three separate tells, large city mounds. One known locally as Timrud, another known as Korsabad, and a third as Koyunyik. He decided to go and have a look at these tells and investigate them. He ended up spending two weeks staying at Mosul. And he walked around the whole area and he realized that the tells marked three points on what was really a very large city complex. That it would take him, and it took him, three days to go from Mosul to Nimrud, then from Nimrud up to Khorsabad, and then back to Mosul. And the whole area he walked over was covered with the remains of pottery and other indications of buildings. He knew his Bible, like all good Christian men at this time. And the one thing that the Bible does say about the city of Nineveh, 
the capital of the Assyrians, was that it was a city so large it would take a man three days to see everything there. So he realized that this particular area must be the location of Nineveh. He identified the separate mounds as being probably palaces or temple complexes. He wasn't quite exactly certain what they might be. But then when he looked at the sites again more carefully, he noticed that at Nimrud, and only at Nimrud, were the obvious remains of a ziggurat. It stands something like 30 metres high. Uh, it's all made of mud brick. Everything has gone into the landscape like this. And at this point, he remembered his classical history. A Greek general named Xenophon, in the year 70, do, 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 forgotten the year, five something a year, he checks his notes. That's the most obvious thing to do, isn't it? Da, 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 401. I'm going way too early there. In the year 401, had taken a group of Greek soldiers to fight for the Persians. Well, they were defeated. And Xenophon, then with his 10,000 soldiers, had to march back to Greece. They decided to take a shortcut. They went up the Tigris. They eventually went through uh, the mountains of eastern Turkey. They eventually arrived somewhere in the area of Trabzon. Xenophon wrote an account of what he saw. Xenophon and the March of the 10,000. And in this, he says that they went through the ancient city of Nineveh and that they could recognize it from its ziggurat. So Xenophon gave Nim um, Layard the clue that Nimrod might actually be Nineveh. And he decided there and then that he would excavate this site to find physical evidence for the truth of the Bible. But he had to carry on to Baghdad. He had important messages to take there, so he went down to Baghdad. Uh, that's the ziggurat there, just to give you some idea of what it's like today. Not very impressive, but originally a major temple site. He made his way to Baghdad, and when he arrived in Baghdad, he resigned his job in Ceylon. He told Mitford to go on ahead. He, Layard, was going to stay and somehow find the money so he could go back and excavate at Nimrud. A priority, though, was to get some money to live on. He didn't have much money with him. And he found a job with the British Embassy in uh, Baghdad, in which he was sent off to one part of Persia, the Bakhtiari region, uh, with the intention of discovering what there might be there of economic value. Now, at this time, of course, nobody knew the economic value of oil, but everybody knew the economic value of various other uh, things available in Persia. He did a quick course in Arabic, went out dressed like this to the Bactory region. He spent a year there trying to find out what natural resources there were, learning about the local peoples, and eventually made his way back to Baghdad and gave in his report. His mission in the Bakhtiari region was so successful that the British ambassador in Baghdad decided that he should go to Constantinople to work at the principal British embassy in the Ottoman Empire. And so Layard started to make his way back to Constantinople in 1842, on the way, going through Mosul, where he found to his horror that the French consul, a man called Paul Emile Botta, had started digging at the site. Well, Botta was working at the northwest mound, the Koyunyik mound, the Koyunyik Tell. So Layard was hopeful that he wouldn't start working down at the Nimrud site, which Layard believed was Nineveh. So having made a note of what Botta was doing, he then continued on his way to Constantinople, where he met up with the ambassador. Sir Stratford Canning, the person that most museum directors in Turkey hate. Why do they hate him? Well, in the early 19th century, throughout the 19th century, the Ottoman authorities really didn't have any interest in the ancient remains in Turkey or anywhere else. 
This is how large pieces of the mausoleum at Halicarnassus went to the British Museum. The Nereid monument from Xanthus went to the British Museum. The Ottoman authorities were simply not interested in them. But Sir Stratford Canning, when he heard about what Layard had seen and what Layard thought might lie under the ground at uh, Mosul or, or the site of Nimrud, he immediately realised, well, this might be a chance to get some even better antiquities for the British Museum. The middle of the 19th century, it's a time when it is hard to believe now in the 21st century but this was a time when European nations were in competition with each other to collect antiquities from all over the world to create the best museums. This was seen as a public duty, as a national duty. So when Sir Stratford Canning heard that the French were already digging at the site near Mosul, he thought, I'd better get some money and arrange for Layard to go back there. Well, it took another three years before he actually got the money to pay for Layard to go back to Nimrud. And he told Layard, well, here's some money, I think it was 80 English pounds, something like that. Go off and do some work there. See what you can find, and if you find something really nice, I'll get some more money, and I'll get an official permit from the Ottoman Sultan for you to do your work there. Don't let anybody know what you're doing, otherwise there will be big trouble. So Layard, went off on his way back to the site of Nimrud with enough money to employ only six workmen. This is what the site of Nimrud looks like today. It looks very much as if several bombs have hit it. Uh, but actually, these are the remains of Layard's excavations over here on the southwest corner and the northwest corner over there. And as you can see, lots of other holes have been dug into the ground by uh, treasure hunters as well. Well, Layard arrived at the site and started to make a plan of it. And he decided at first to dig in the northwest corner of the mound. Within a few hours, literally, his workmen found a large wall with cuneiform writing on it. They cleared away a little bit more of the ground. They found eventually that this was the wall, one wall of a room that was something like 10 meters long. The walls of the room were lined with carvings and cuneiform inscriptions. And here we see Layard at work at Nimrud. Uh, I like this drawing in particular because you still use the same type of baskets for excavations in Turkey and the Middle East today except they're made of rubber tires now. But they're exactly the same shape. The shape hasn't changed in over 150 years. But mixed in with the remains of the collapsed walls, what Layard found was the most remarkable collection of pieces of carved ivory. He recognized that some of these must have fallen from the wall proper, that originally these had been wall decorations. Well, ivory from the elephant, presumably uh, Indian elephant ivory. So this indicated to Layard that he'd found the remains of a building that must represent something like a palace. This is a very large building. Some of the walls covered with reliefs carved in stone, cuneiform inscriptions. Other walls with these beautiful ivory carvings. And he could see that there was a kind of Egyptian influence in some of these carvings, which meant that whoever had lived at this site must have had contacts with Egypt as well. As he got down to the floor of the room, he began to find even more ivory carvings. He realized that these were the remains of furniture decoration. The wooden furniture had decayed over the centuries. All that was left was the ivory carving. And again, he could see clear signs of Egyptian influence in some of these but also local Mesopotamian uh, uh, reliefs like this. More and more of these carvings, again, this sort of strange mixture, some of them very clearly Egyptian, some of them very clearly Mesopotamian. Uh, one piece of ivory, which probably came from the back of a chair, seemed to have been imported directly from uh, Egypt, very badly broken, but you can see you have a cartouche there uh, with the name of an Egyptian pharaoh in it. 
and other pieces of furniture decoration, again very distinctly uh, Egyptian. So Layard now knew that the site at Nimrud, which he thought was Nineveh, was certainly a very, very important site. He realised that what he'd found was a royal palace. He did some work on the other side of the site as well, and then he discovered the remains of yet another royal palace. Again, he found the remains of a very large building, the walls of the building decorated with relief carvings like this. So you have, for example, an Assyrian king there going hunting, uh, one lion in front, one lion coming from behind, an Assyrian king making a sacrifice there. Uh, these carvings were often covered with cuneiform writing. But unfortunately for Layard, this cuneiform writing had not yet been deciphered. There were three types of cuneiform writing, three different languages. And in 1842, only one of these had actually been properly deciphered. This was in something else, another language altogether. But all the evidence was quite clear. The, the, what he found was the remains of royal palaces. Uh, he could broadly date them to uh, the Assyrian period from the style of the carvings, the hairstyles. Um, remarkable decoration, beautiful detail of the beard. I love this one with the, uh, the man coming in with two pet monkeys like that. So he knew he had something really very important at Nimrud. Well, we now know that this was the palace of somebody called Ashunar Sirpal. So that's why I put his name in brackets there. But this is just another set of uh, reliefs from that same palace site. And that's the detail of the one we saw earlier of Ashunar uh, Sirpal uh, going hunting. Well, he decided that these had to be sent off to the British Museum. But before doing so, he then started to do more work in the palace area and found something even more remarkable. And that was that the entrances to the rooms in the palace, the main entrances, were marked by enormous statues, three meters, four meters high, showing a human head on the body of either a bull or a sphinx. These were extraordinary discoveries, which also he decided he must go back to the British Museum. And I stress this point, they had to go back to the British Museum because that's what the palace sites look like now, with no reliefs at all uh, on the site. <clears throat> in the last season of his work there, in uh, 1842, 1845, he found this remarkable object as well. He considered this to be potentially the most important document from the site. Because what it showed, it was a, carved out of a black stone. And on each side, there were a series of relief carvings with cuneiform inscriptions, cuneiform inscriptions beneath, which he couldn't read. But what they clearly showed was the surrender of foreign kings to the Assyrian ruler. So in here, for example, you have the Assyrian ruler, Notice the little umbrella held up behind him to keep the sun off his head. And the Assyrian ruler is greeting the foreign king who's bowing down before him. One of the court officials bringing in that particular ruler. He thought that this might be one of the most significant discoveries from the site because he could recognize that it told the story of five foreign kings who had surrendered to the Assyrian king. So therefore, if the cuneiform inscription could be deciphered, he could learn more about Assyrian history. The upper registers of the stone show quite clearly scenes of surrender because we have slaves here carrying various goods, tribute, um, gold, silver, wheat, all sorts of things like that to the Assyrian king. Well, Layard then set about removing the objects, the larger objects from the site to send them to the British Museum. Uh, it took a lot of work to actually uh, decide exactly how to do this. A lot of manpower. He's doing this secretly. Technically, nobody knows he's working there. He doesn't have a permit. But he's had enough money to pay the local tribal ruler 
to do what he wants. So here we see one of the bull-headed statues being taken out of the doorway. You can see the reliefs in the background, more cuneiform inscriptions on either side. And this wonderful drawing showing how the, the statue was then taken from Nimrud. There's the ziggurat. You can see the tell quite clearly to the river Tigris. Now in the British Museum, so if you want to see them, there, turn left at the entrance door, don't go through the shopping centre, ignore the Egyptian gallery, and you'll find them in the next room along. And they're really very remarkable uh, pieces indeed. And you can get some idea of their scale from the figures in the background there. Well, Layard had now had to deal with two problems. He'd been working at the site secretly for six months. He was only supposed to go there for two months. He didn't have a permit and he'd run out of money. And so in 1846, he goes back to Constantinople and Sir Stratford Canning says, well, I don't have any money at the moment, but I will get you an official permit. Layard now writes to his family in England. They hadn't heard from him for about three years. Can you imagine it? The type of letter that you might write to your parents after disappearing for three years. Hi, Mum and Dad. I'm OK. Uh, by the way, can you send me lots of money so I can excavate this archaeological site? Strangely enough, they sent the money to him. And so he went back to the site. Uh, and so he, he uh, then um, decided to go back to the site. But he then fell ill. And so he made his way back to London. And when he arrived in London, he received basically a hero's welcome. News of his discoveries had already reached the English public, thanks to English newspapers. Nobody quite knew what he had found. He believed that he'd found the site of Nineveh. He arrived back in England in 1847, and in 1848, he's persuaded to publish an account of his work there. So he publishes this book, The Monuments of Nineveh, by Austin Henry Layard, a squire. He doesn't have a degree, so he's just called a squire. And it's filled with all these wonderful uh, reconstruction drawings of what the palace rooms would look like. When Layard excavated the site at Nimrud, you could still see the remains of paint on some of the walls. So he knew that the reliefs had originally been painted in realistic colour. Now they're a horrible sort of grey, basic grey colour. But he could also see that the walls must have been decorated in high colour as well, in addition to be decorated uh, with ivory uh, carvings uh, in, as well. So he arrives back in England. He published his book, Nineveh and His Remains. He really becomes the most famous person of the time. The book was reprinted three times in one year. And it became one of those books that everybody had to read just so that they could say they had read it. You know, you were considered completely ignorant if you hadn't read this book on how Layard had discovered the remains of ancient Nineveh, the city mentioned in the Bible. Well, 1848 is when this appears. Layard goes back to Constantinople, leaving behind his wonderful reputation, his carvings, the, the carvings he'd taken from the site are beginning to arrive there so people can actually see how the Assyrians lived. And when he gets back to Constantinople, he receives a little bit of a shock. Henry Rawlinson had deciphered the second of the cuneiform languages. It was the, sec the same cuneiform script that was used at Nimrud. He could read the inscription that Layard had copied at Nimrud. Nimrud was not Nineveh. It was another site mentioned in the Bible, a place called Kala, which was not far from Nineveh. But Layard, of course, was terribly disappointed. He's just made this enormous amount of money and reputation, discovering Nimrud, publishing his finds from Nimrud, claiming this was Nineveh. But on the plus side, there always is a plus side to everything. Even on a rainy day like this, the sun will shine eventually. Now that the second of the cuneiform scripts could be read, people could actually read what was written on the walls of the palaces at Nimrud. And in this way, 
Rawlinson was able to say that the one palace, the big palace, was the palace of Ashurnasirpal, who reigned from 883 to 859 BC. The second palace was the palace of Shalmaneser uh, the third. The other great thing was being able to read all the inscriptions in these palaces. Because this gave a piece of information, the sort of information that Layard was really hoping to find. It described what the Assyrian rulers did to their enemies. So, for example, Ashurnasirpal, how does he deal with his enemies when he defeats them? Many of the prisoners I took, I burned in a fire. Many I took alive. From some I cut off their hands. From others I cut off their noses, ears and fingers. I put out the eyes of many of the soldiers. I burned their young men, women and children to death. I killed the nobles who had rebelled against me and spread their skins out on the piles, on pieces of wood. Horrible, isn't it? But this is exactly what the Bible said the Assyrians used to do. So, more proof coming to light that the Bible stories were true. Well, that's how Ashurnasirpal deals with his enemies. What about Shalmaneser? I slew 14,000 of their warriors with the sword. I brought destruction on them. I scattered their bodies far and wide and covered the plain with their bodies. With my weapons, I made their blood flow down the valleys of the land. The plain was too small for their bodies to fall. The wide countryside was used to bury them. With their bodies, I built a bridge over the Arantu River, the River Orontes. So again, you know, these are people who are mentioned in the Bible, mentioned in Greek histories as well. And the Bible talks about the type of thing the Assyrians did when they defeated people. So now it's possible to read the inscriptions, more proof coming that the Bible stories, or at least some of them, might be true. Layard, meanwhile, is sitting in Constantinople, waiting to get some more money to go back to the excavation. Eventually, some money comes from the British government. The British Museum agrees to help support him. And in 1849, he is made the head of the British archaeological mission to Mesopotamia, by agreement with the Ottoman Sultan, and he can take back or send back to the British Museum whatever he wants to find. Well, he now knows that Nimrud cannot be Nineveh. He's had a look at the work that Bota has done at the site of Koyanyik. Koyanyik is a much bigger tell than, of course, a bad site. So he decides that, well, the Bible says that Nineveh is by the river Tigris. Xenophon says it's by the river Tigris. So this is much more likely to be uh, Nineveh, now that we know that that is a kahal down there. He starts working at the Koyanyuk site with uh, something like 100 workmen altogether. It's a massive earthen mound made of mud brick, basically, collapsed mud brick. It stands something like 20 meters high. He knows it will take him a long time to dig down into the mound. And so he decides to dig tunnels into it instead. This is what the surface of the mound looks like. You can't really get a proper idea, but you can just get some idea of the buildings over there, just how high the actual mound is. Uh, that's what the mound looks like from Mosul itself. So he starts working on the site. He makes a plan of the visible remains. He sees the site of what might have been a ziggurat, but he's not entirely clear about that. And then he sets his workmen to dig tunnels through the site. He doesn't actually excavate it from the top down. They tunnel their way through. And immediately, they start to find the remains of what is clearly a palace. Rooms lined with the same type of reliefs that he'd seen at Nimrud. So ivory furniture, or the remains of ivory furniture he finds here. He knows he's working in a palace again. Then he starts to make even more interesting discoveries. There are the remains of human-headed bull statues, but the heads have been broken off 
and the statues are damaged by fire. So he now realises that this palace must have been destroyed in a major fire. Well, that's what the, that statue looked like when it was found uh, by Layard. That's what it looks like. Now you can see how the whole of the statue is crumpled up, been burnt off uh, in a fire. The statue on the other side, fortunately, has survived uh, quite well. So he thinks this might be it. This is a big palace. When he starts to look at the cuneiform inscriptions, he finds that they are written in the first of the cuneiform scripts. So they can be read. And this allows him to identify this site as being the palace of Sennacherib I. Sennacherib I. He is named in the Bible as the ruler of Nineveh and Assyria. So Layard knows that the Koyanyik site has to be Nineveh. We know from other sources he was ruler between 705 and 681 BC. And the Bible tells us that he invaded uh, Ju uh, Judah and defeated the Israelites in about the year 701 BC. We know from other sources and from the Bible that in that particular campaign he captured and destroyed a major Israelite city, a place called Lachish. When he captured Lachish, he took all the Israelites living there prisoner and he deported them to Mesopotamia. These are the ten lost tribes of Israel, which are talked about a lot in the Bible. From other sources, we know that the campaign against the Israelites was just one part of a major war that Sennacherib I fought in that region and which lasted until 691. The war had started with a rebellion in Babylon. The people of Babylon rebelled against him. He captured Babylon and then went on to defeat the friends of the Babylonians, people known as the Chaldeans and the Elamites. He then decides to invade Judea or Judah as it was then called. He even attempts an invasion of Egypt. And the invasion of Egypt is mentioned in Egyptian records. So this is known about from the Egyptian records, which were deciphered, of course, by Champollion only 30 years or so, uh, 20 years or so before Layard's work in, at um, the Koyunyuk site. In 689, the people of Babylon rebelled against Sennacherib, and he destroyed the site even though it was one of the most important religious centers of Mesopotamia. This caused many of his subjects to turn against him. And in the end, he was murdered by two of his sons, who then destroyed the palace and the city of Nineveh, which explained to Layard, of course, what he had found. Fire-damaged reliefs, fire-damaged statues. But Layard now knows he is actually working in the palace of a person mentioned in the Bible. We can name that person of Sennacherib. Well, even though the palace of Sennacherib, uh, they is still careless of comfort, drawing inscriptions at Koyunyek, uh, even though the palace had been very badly damaged in this fire when the two sons murdered their father, he was able eventually to complete a, a plan of it and understand something of its structure. It measures 503 by 242 meters. It was built basically of mud brick, but the mud brick stood on top of a platform of solid rock, rock which had been brought to the site. He calculated that something like 160 million mud bricks were used in its construction and that the palace must have stood something like 22 meters above ground level. He found 71 separate rooms, 27 of them, 27 with doorways entered by these human-headed bill figures. And almost all of the rooms, of course, were filled with these beautiful carvings. Well, we do actually know something about what the palace originally looked like as I'll come back later. But the reliefs that he found inside the palace, he calculated 
that if you put them end to end, then this would stretch through a distance of something like three kilometers, all these beautiful reliefs. The reliefs were eventually taken back to the British Museum. Very badly fire damaged, so Layard only sent the best examples back. But they give us a wonderful picture of Assyrian life, Assyrians at war, and the cuneiform inscriptions tell us even more about the Assyrian. Well, these are some of the reliefs as they're displayed in the British Museum today. That's what the rooms where they came from look like today. Mud brick walls held up by these pieces of stone, so basically not too, uh, surviving too well. Well, the reliefs give us a beautiful view over not just everyday life, but the appearance of Nineveh. So, for example, we have this scene identified by a cuneiform inscription as representing Nineveh. You've got a hunting scene taking place outside. Here we see the defences of Nineveh with one of the uh, gate towers there. And behind it, what has to be the royal palace, because you've got representations of these human-headed bull statues on there. In fact, the reliefs are so good and they show so much detail that somebody called Saddam Hussein decided to rebuild part of the site. So if you go to uh, the site today, if you make your way to Mosul, and it's perfectly safe around Mosul and Erbil, Honestly, very safe. The Bill Kent Orchestra goes to uh, Bill three, four times a year. So you'll be okay there. So you have this reconstructed uh, or restored gateway, courtesy of Saddam Hussein. The reliefs show us how, for example, these enormous three to four meter high statues, human headed statues, were brought from the stone quarries several kilometers away from Mosul, and then set up to decorate the site. Well, this is one of the reliefs that actually shows one of these statues being taken back by workmen to the palace site. You can see it's very badly fire damaged. We're only looking at one part of it, but you can just see one of these statues here with four of the uh, organizers, the managers, uh, saying what needs to go where. If we look at a drawing of the actual relief, it will become much clearer. This is the part we were just looking at, where you have the statue on a sledge being pulled by slaves, as we now know, uh, a group of soldiers watching what's going on, uh, men bringing down earth from the hill to help make a ramp for the statue to be pulled up. And there's Sennacherib up here, underneath his umbrella, actually watching what's going on. Perhaps the most remarkable of the reliefs, though, are those that show the Battle of Lachish, again identified by the cuneiform inscription there. It shows it rather like a strip cartoon in a series of sequences. So here, for example, we see the first attack on the main gateway of the Israelite city of Lachish. We see the Israelite defenders up there. And then the next stage, we see the Assyrian archers climbing up the city mound, climbing up the walls of Lachish. More details of how the battle goes on. So you have these sling men throwing stones and a very efficient weapon. Uh, even today, uh, in parts of the Middle East, young boys and old men can use this to throw a stone very accurately over 100 meters. It's very popular with the Palestinian young boys for hitting Israel soldiers. Very accurate indeed. A very ancient weapon, as you can see from this slide here. Here we see some Assyrian soldiers trying to dig a hole into the defenses of Lachish. And then we see not the first appearance of what we can recognize as a tank or a panzer, but it's an armored vehicle, man-powered, with a battering ram on the front, which the Assyrians are using to knock down the walls of Lachish. And here again at the bottom, you see dead Israelites falling down. They're lying there dead. More archers over here in the background. And here, some captured Israelites who've been 
strung up on poles. Vlad Dracula, who did this in Romania in the 14th and 15th century, people were doing it a long time before him. This relief is again rather badly fire damaged. But you can make out enough detail to see the royal chariot here of um, Sennacherib. There is his umbrella. Sennacherib himself sitting up here on a chair. Uh, I should have taken a detailed shot of this, which shows various captured uh, prisoners and kings. He's being fanned as the leader of the Israelite city of Lachish comes to give him surrender. All the people of Lachish lining up behind pleading for forgiveness, promising they will never ever again rebel against the Assyrians. Then what follows are the scenes after the Battle of Lachish. We have several panels of this thing show the, some of the survivors from the battle being led away into captivity, mainly young women and children. But they're taken with them Various things, gold, silver, bronze, wheat, food, all of these things are now being taken back to Nineveh. This is what we call booty. And you have a detail on the uh, left-hand side, on the right-hand side there. Booty always makes you smile, you see, because it makes you rich. Gold and silver, booty. And you have that beautiful detail over there. Then we see what happens, Assyrian fashion to the warriors. Some of the warriors are basically stuck on a pointed wooden stick like this. This is a method of punishment which Vlad Dracula of Romania used very often. It's called impaling. Some of the nobles get a slightly different treatment. They are stretched out and tied down to the ground and then their skin is removed while they are alive. Remember that sentence from the um, other inscription about piling up the skins of the nobles? This is exactly what happens. All the treasures, of course, from Lachish have to be listed. Why was writing invented? So that you could pay your taxes. So that rulers and governments can make a record of what's coming in. And here we see two Assyrian scribes or writers making a record of the different objects captured at Lachish. Now going back to Nineveh, we see a collection of bows from bows and arrows there. These are probably bronze vases, bronze cooking pots, swords, other items that we can't properly identify. And right at the end of this collection of reliefs, of course, we have party time. Sennacherib sits down with all his rulers, Bring on the musicians like this, and let's celebrate our major defeat, uh, uh, this defeat of the uh, Israelites. Well, this was absolutely a wonderful series of reliefs. And as you can imagine, many of these, and as you have seen, many of these did make their way back to uh, the, the British Museum. But in the very last days of the excavation, Layard found what is in many ways, the most important discovery of the whole site. One of the wars, shown the battle scenes of Lachish, had an inscription in cuneiform. And it says how Hezekiah, a Judah king from Jerusalem, the, real, the royal city, Ur stands for a city, Ursalium, Ursalium, the city of Jerusalem, surrenders to the Assyrians. This is what is reported in the Bible. This inscription was the first independent evidence for any of the rulers of the Israelites, apart from the Bible. So this is a very important inscription. But even more was to come, because one of the rooms was found to contain a collection of clay tablets. And Layard recognised that these were probably the royal records of the Assyrians. These actually give us Assyrian history as the Assyrians saw it. It's, it was a find that equals, thanks to Rawlinson being able to read uh, the cuneiform, it's a find that equaled the discovery of Egypt, thanks to Champollion uh, and the hieroglyphs. So this particular clay tablet, for example, found at Kuyunyik, 
records all the military campaigns of Sennacherib I in tremendous detail. Historical information we just simply do not have from other sources. Well, they are now even more famous, if anything, than before. He returns to England in 1851. He was ill with malaria yet again. He arrives back in England. Heroes welcome. The man who has discovered the biblical city of Nineveh. He was the man who everybody wanted to meet. Everybody wanted to take out for dinner and things like that. He writes another book, Nineveh and Babylon. He did a bit of work at Babylon, didn't find very much. Wonderfully illustrated here with his reconstruction drawing of the palace of Sennacherib, showing those bull-headed figures, uh, human-headed figures, just like on the relief carvings there. He points out in this book that Kuyunyuk is actually the site of Nineveh, uh, not Nimrud, uh, that the three tales at Mosul, Korsabad, Nimrud, and Koyunyik would take three days to walk around, which is what the Bible says about Nineveh. This was really a tremendous piece of publicity and writing as well. Layard had an amazing gift for writing in a way that people could understand, but it was very evocative. It made all these things come to light. Londoners could go to the British Museum and see carvings of the Assyrian kings named in the Bible, hunting, having a party, defeating the Israelites. Everything made Bible history, or at least part of it, come alive. It's a wonderful discovery in that way. Well, Layard had discovered, basically, a civilization that was only recorded in the Bible. He made it come alive. But in 1852, instead of deciding to go back to work at Koyunik, the British Museum wouldn't give him any money. The British Museum were very good like that. They did the same thing to Belzoni. He became a politician. He then went on to actually serve as a diplomat in Constantinople. He never went back to Nimrud. He never went back to Koyunik or Mosul. That was the end of his archaeological career in many ways. He took no interest in archaeology, as far as we know, after 1852, except in 1857. In 1857, Rawlinson deciphered the third cuneiform script. He was able to read the language on the black obelisk found at Nimrud. He could identify the obelisk as having been built, uh, put up by Shalmaneser III. But many ways, what was even more exciting was that he could read the, the cuneiform on this particular panel. And it says, Yehu, son of Omri, surrenders to Shalmaneser. There is only one Yehu, son of Omri, known of, in the historical record. Yehu, son of Omri, was the king of Israel in about 850 BC. So for the first time ever, and in fact the only time up to today, we can actually look at what an Israelite king looked like, as you can see in more detail there. This, of course, was exactly the kind of thing that Layard had hoped to find when he started work at Nimrud thinking it was Nineveh. The discovery was made very early on, but it wasn't until 1857 that this was actually revealed for what it was. So, Sir Austin Henry Layard, I think really is one of the great discoveries in archaeology. Not an adventurer, he doesn't go out like an Indiana Jones or something like that, but rather like Champollion, the work of Champollion on hieroglyphs, he brought to life an ancient civilization which was only otherwise recorded in books written by other people. Okay. All right, that's enough for today.